Sure. So um, first, tell us how the um, Woody Guthrie Prize actually got started. It got started in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we opened up the Woody Guthrie Center there. I had moved the archive from New York, where it had been with our family my whole life. And uh, at a certain age, I realized I had to make some decisions about what the, where the legacy was going to go. And uh, just to back up a little bit, I, I thought that LA and New York really didn't need Woody Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, where, where would he be important to be in this day and age, in this time? And I thought back in Oklahoma would be a perfect place for him to, and for us to create a center, almost like a maypole that would be used to dance around and to build over time a dance that had to do with Woody's ideals and legacy. And once we created the archive and the center, then the next step was to broaden out and to, to bring people in to what we were doing. And a prize always does that. You, you mentioned uh, LA and New York. And of course, even though those cities might not have needed the Woody Guthrie archives, both cities play a part rather large part in Woody's life and, and, and his musical legacy. Just briefly describe each city and its role to Woody Guthrie. Well, the obvious thing is from California to the New York Island, <laughs> which was his personal legacy, which is interesting because the song, This Land is Your Land, I've always thought as a, almost like a diary, a, a travelogue in a way of where he spent his life. And much of it started uh, his mature life started in Los Angeles, where he became uh, introduced to politics, actually, uh, to left wing politics in particular, and to the union movement, specifically the labor movement, where he met people like actor Will Gear, uh, the newspapers that were writing about labor laws and immigrant migrant rights at the time. And that was really his education. And then in 1940, he traveled across the country to New York at the behest of actor Will Gear, who was working with a progressive political center in New York City and said, you know, you ought to come out to New York because they, they'll get what you're talking about. <laughs> it was kind of a, a, a camaraderie, you know, with Woody and the, and the New York City progressive community. But Woody never left his uh, feelings for the Midwest and for the heartland. So as much he was getting educated on one side of the country and the other side of the country, he was bringing all of that information to the Midwest and as he traveled across the country, which he did quite a lot. But those two centers were the maturation points for him one where he got his political education in Los Angeles and New York City, where he developed his political ideas. Now, you, uh, the, the Guthrie family, of course, among other places, <clears throat> lived in Coney Island, and you grew up in Coney Island. And so what, where what, I got uh, my political ideals <laughs> on the boardwalk, the <laughs> under the boardwalk. <laughs> <laughs> what do, what are your your uh, recollections of your father as, as a little boy? What kind of father was he? What kind of what kind what did he teach you? Well, to be honest, my father had developed Huntington's disease when I was just a toddler. So my whole life with him was with a man who was seriously ill with a very serious disease. So my whole childhood was, I would say, living with those ideals and ideas and politics, but physically not really having a father to hold my hand or hug me or talk about things with me because Huntington's was such a severe illness. And he had it for 15 years, most of my life. He passed away when I was 17. And strangely, it wasn't until I was older in my 40s when I really got close to him 
through his writings, through reading his diaries. It was like a, that was my woke moment <laughs> in a sense with my father. Um, but life, I would say reflected, even though he wasn't a part of it on a daily basis, what we were exposed to, the people we knew, the songs we sang, the places we lived, all reflected very much his, uh, his ideals, what he believed in. So in a way, he, he was the, a, a ghost father, you know, an invisible father. Everything was there. The meat was there, but the body was uh, troubled. Mm -hmm. you, clearly, he has impacted you, as you say, since the 1940s. Um, and he's impacted many other people, which is why I think we have something called the Woody Guthrie Prize. Talk about how important the Woody Guthrie Prize is to you in terms of carrying on your father's legacy. Well, I think it's straight and it strengthens our network. Um, we're this invisible, well, everyone has a network of people that they hang with, that they sing with, that they dance with, that they live with, whatever that network is. And in our community, it was, a lot of it was this idea that your life should be used to help others, period. <laughs> kind of simple, right? Um, so, well, the Woody Guthrie Prize is a way of holding that network together and not letting it fall apart, especially in this day and age where there are other very strong networks, so to speak, <laughs> and they have their way of holding together. And my father says, we have our way of holding together too. And we really have to build it, use, utilize it, keep it strong. So for instance, there are people that are part of our network uh, that you won't see at the Oscars. You might, you won't see at the Grammys. You won't see them on the people's list of favorite movies, you know, the commercial stations, but that doesn't mean we don't exist. And I think it's really, really important to always let people know, because you never know who's going to want to join your network, that we are here, we exist, and we're strong, and we're holding together. Are you surprised at the number of, let's, shall we say, Woody Guthrie type songs that have just sprouted seemingly everywhere in the last year or two, particularly with the George Floyd death, Black Lives Matter, and, and many people of color also understanding the power and use of, of song as an agent for change in, in, in this country? I'm so happy. I'm just happy. Again, is to uh, it's like someone opened a door and let our voices sing. For many, many years, and a lot of young people might not know about this, there was something called the McCarthy era when our voices were not allowed to speak and radios were not allowed to play our music and television was not allowed to have our artists on. People like Pete Seeger, was kept off of television for 25 years. So talk about how to get your message across, how to build a movement, how to build a community without that kind of um, media support. You can imagine how difficult that was. But you know what? We did it anyway. We did it in person. We did it in living rooms. We did it in parking lots. We did it in Washington Square Park. Uh, there were many places that, again, held that community together. And now things have really changed so much in terms of media, social media, where those voices can be loud and clear. And CNN's covering it. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's quite a change from the way things used to be. Yeah. When I look back at the recipients of, uh, of the Woody Guthrie Prize, it's not just musicians. Um, you, you have other people, well, in particular one. Talk, talk about the breadth and scope of what the pro where the prize actually uh, looks for, if you will, uh, new recipients. Well, I guess it kind of grows to some extent out of my own uh, childhood in my life. My father was a multimedia artist as much as he was a songwriter. He was also a visual artist. 
He was a poet. He was a novelist. He was a journalist. Uh, he participated in the culture in every which way he could. Whatever talents were given to him, he sang it, he drew it, he painted it, he spoke it, he acted it out, he danced it, <laughs> whatever he could. So basically I find that, you know, we didn't want to limit the idea of consciousness to folk singers. <laughs> they are really not the only ones. Even politicians have <laughs> some out there have some good consciences. So you know, the idea was to really, if you're going to represent Woody, you'd have to really represent all those fields and represent people in every way that uh, that speak up for good causes. And there are so many of them. I mean, why would you want to just limit it to a folk singer? They didn't invent protest music. <laughs> This year's recipient, of course, is Bruce Springsteen. Um, in your opinion, how has Bruce carried on uh, the legacy of your father, musically speaking? One of the things that I absolutely love about Bruce's work is his loyalty to his community, his loyalty to his street people, his loyalty to his ancestry, he speaks for them. He speaks for the people on his block. He speaks for the people on any block. And that's exactly where Woody was. I remember, you know, when he, when he first started writing the Dust Bowl ballads, he wasn't writing anthems. He wasn't writing pop songs. He was writing songs about his neighbors, the people on the street. They happened to be experiencing the Dust Bowl at the time. <laughs> um, so Woody always identified with his people, what he considered his people, which at the time were the disenfranchised, these many uneducated um, people that, that were in trouble for different reasons with the law even. Anyway, so I always felt like Bruce was a perfect mirror of that kind of an artist. You know, he wasn't speaking above his pay in a way. He was really speaking for his people exactly like what he did. What were they going through? What was their street like? What were their problems? Who was for them? Who was against them? How could he help? Blah, blah, blah. So I felt like he was a very much a contemporary mirror image in that, in that love for his street. You mentioned that it's not just folk singers who use music in a very constructive way, political way. Um, and today, of course, uh, the primary kind of music, pop music, that, that really has embraced the legacy of Woody in an interesting way is, uh, is hip hop, is hip hop. How do you think Woody Guthrie would have felt if he heard hip hop? What would he have thought of the whole art of hip hop from, from the rhyming and the beats and things, how would he, have, would he, would he have embraced it today? Would he have uh, been a part of that? What do you think? Well, Woody was mostly about words. It was about words and ideas. He very rarely wrote a melody. <laughs> he, he was no Paul McCartney when it comes to beautiful melodies <laughs> or Billy Joel. Um, his art was about the word. And he said, I, I hope I quote it right, there's no trick to making up a song once you realize that the music is the word and the people are the song. That's a great definition of hip hop. The people are the song. The word is the music, how you say it, how you phrase it. Uh, I, I don't see really any difference between the two. Yeah. As a Guthrie, um, and of course, there's there's your brother as well, Arlo, who's been playing and, and carrying on musically in his father's footsteps. Do you have a special responsibility to make certain that Woody's legacy remains alive? Do you have a special um, need, if you will, to to just 
remind the world that this guy represented something very special, very important, very necessary for today? Uh, my life is very much like uh, James Stewart. It's a beautiful life. He has the travel pictures in his back pocket. That's what he wants to do all his life. But circumstances come along and he has to save the bank and save the people and help the people. <laughs> and I thought, this is my life in a nutshell. <laughs> um, uh, did I long for this legacy? No. Did I ever consider it? No, It's it came to me. It's like, okay, okay. <laughs> I got to do this. Uh, who else is going to? And I've always felt like th I was the void filler. Wherever there was something that was missing in terms of who could do it. And this is true in general in life. Um, where's the space that needs filling? Where's the help that needs a hand? Um, and that became what was given to me over, snuck in. I snuck it in over a period of time. And I, I always called myself his secretary. Um, someone had to be there to answer the phone when somebody had a question about Woody Guthrie. I mean, when Bob Dylan first came to New York, he came to our house because my mother was there. There was somebody you could go to if you wanted to find out about Woody Guthrie. Luckily, my mother opened the door. As a matter of fact, I didn't open the door when he first came because we weren't allowed to have strangers in the house. That's another story. <laughs> um, but in, in effect, there always has to be someone there to open the door for someone who wants to know not just about Woody, but there's a whole bunch of information. There's stories. There's stories about deportees. There's stories about Sacco and Vanzetti, people who are accused of crimes they didn't come. There's all kinds of stories in Woody's legacy. And most of the people that come actually are looking for information about those stories. And they find those stories through Woody's work. So I've always been, I've taken on the job of my mother and just, I'll open the door, <laughs> say hi or answer the phone and see how I can help. Yeah. And for those people who are interested in learning about Woody Guthrie, instead of going to your house, they could go to Tulsa, <laughs> Oklahoma and go to the Woody Guthrie Center, of course, which is really a, a wonderful place. It's where all of Woody's papers are stored. There's exhibits there. There's opportunities to really understand him, his music, what he meant, what he stood for in, in a really exciting way. You know, la last question, or before I let you go, um, it's, it's always interesting that Every now and then a new Woody Guthrie song pops up or you announce that you found something in the archives. Uh, has there ever been a more prolific songwriter than Woody Guthrie? I, I can't think of one. I mean, I, I can't even think anyone who comes close. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an ethnomusicologist, so I don't really know who's out there. I can tell you what he's done and he's written over 3000 songs, but they're not all good. <laughs> so Woody was a writer. He was a lover of words. He put down everything in his brain, in his heart, in his soul on paper. So there was no way, especially in those days, as I mentioned before, he was blacklisted. Nobody was about to give him a record contract to record all his songs. He got Huntington's disease early in life in his 40s. So his career, quote unquote, ended quite early. And we were really left with um, 3,000 lyrics. To be honest, Bob, I didn't even know there were 3,000 lyrics until I did a count only about 10 years ago. You know, there was a big 40 year span there where we didn't know what the heck we had. And, uh, it, you know, it wasn't until we started the archive in 1994 that we started going through how many notebooks, how many songs, and I remember th showing some of the early song lyrics to Pete Seeger. And I said, what do I know? Like I said, I'm not a folk singer. I'm not an ethnomusicologist. If there's one person who knows every song Woody Guthrie ever wrote, it would be Pete Seeger. And I remember showing him a couple of them and he was like, oh no, no, never heard that one. Oh, really? 
Woody wrote that? No, never heard it. And I thought, oh, for crying out loud. Um, how can you have a legacy when only 5% of a person's output is even known? So I thought my job was not to be his publicist, but to get this information out there just so that people know, guess what? He wrote a lot of love songs, actually. <laughs> it wasn't just all politics. He wrote a lot of songs about family life, children's life. He wrote about songs about Judaism. He wrote songs about life and death and, and taxes. I mean, so it was really like a way to catch up for the scholars. And, you know, just as an aside, when we did that first conference in Cleveland in 1996, and I remember there was a panel of experts on the on the stage, and I wasn't one of them. I was in the in the back there, and I heard some of them say things like, "Woody Guthrie never wrote a Moon June Croon love song," and I was like, "Ah, oh, he did." actually <laughs> wait a second <laughs> and i when i heard everybody talking i went oh my god i mean my work is cut out for me not to write a book or to do anything but just like i want to tell them you know so th that became a kind of fun aspect of the work too was the the fun of uh kind of shocking people like pete seeger and say oh guess what? He wrote a love song. <laughs> a lot of love songs. Anyway, that's yeah. my role. Well, right? look, I, I think the work that you've done and uh, your daughter, Anna, and, and others in your family to not only share your father with America and the rest of the world and all the great songs and all the great creative things he's done, but also to carry on the meaning behind them. I think today, as we said before, it's really important. It's really important that we understand that the need to express ourselves through song, to be inspired by song is something that goes way back. And it's very useful. It was very useful then. It's useful today. And I think it's really embodied in this Woody Guthrie prize. So thank you for, uh, on behalf of Bruce Springsteen fans everywhere that uh, finally Bruce is, is going to get this. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure he's very appreciative of it as well. So thank you for spending some time with us. You're and welcome. maybe we'll see you at the Woody Guthrie Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm there all the time. I was there all the time, but um, you know, I, I just want to add one thing that's so important to, these ideas don't belong to anybody. They don't belong to Woody. They don't belong to Bruce. They don't belong to Pete Seeger. These are eternal ideals and feelings about humanity that have been carried on for thousands of years by different people. And I also love the fact that Woody never wanted to be a celebrity, um, that he understood that he was a conduit yeah. for this. And all these recipients are conduits. They're not celebrities. And we don't care if they are celebrities, doesn't get in my way, but um, it's really important to know that they're just conduits the way each one of us is a conduit for this work, whether we get a prize or not. Right. Well said, well said. Well, thank you, Nora. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay, we'll talk soon. <laughs>